Thank you all for coming. Welcome to Parents' Day. It's a real pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about addiction and uh, what BioSci and the School of Biological Sciences is doing to address this uh, global issue. So I'm going to start by uh, a little brief history. Uh, I started off as an undergraduate at uh, CU Boulder, and I was in, in chemical engineering. And at that time, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I got involved in research, doing undergraduate research, and I spent a lot of time in this building. This is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, trying to prevent myself from being electrocuted, uh, <laughs> dissolved by caustic uh, alternative refrigerants, and working behind a three-inch blast shield. It was terrifying but I loved it and it was much better than being in class. And then I missed a prerequisite that landed me an extra year, um, really made my parents angry. And I spent that extra year really diving deep into research. That was what I was absolutely in love with. And, and there I met uh, Carla Kierkegaard who studies um, uh, polio virus using yeast genetics to approach polio virus. And, and really, it was just this language of molecular biology, and she helped me apply to graduate school. Uh, I went uh, and studied the molecular biology of cancer. After about five years, um, in that domain, cancer biology really started uh, evolving into this domain called epigenetics, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. And I realized, reading some of the literature, that there was this beautiful domain of neuroscience where neurons in your brain in a way are very similar to uh, cancer cells. And some of the molecular mechanisms are similar, but in neuroscience, nobody was really talking about epigenetics. And so I switched fields uh, from my postdoc fellowship here at Penn and then went into neuroscience, trying to understand how our brain encodes uh, information into long-term memory. And so that led here to UCI. Uh, here's the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior and, and uh, the faculty and, and postdocs, graduate students, undergrads, and, and started my lab. And so my lab here works on the molecular mechanisms of memory and addiction. And today I'll spend uh, more time talking about addiction, of course. And we know that this is a global health problem. It's absolutely pervasive, whether you're rich, poor, every socioeconomic uh, uh, aspect in between. Um, I'll talk mostly about how this is a brain disorder and some of the mechanisms that are uh, happening in the addicted brain and how these drugs of abuse start to manipulate brain function. Uh, I'll go into how team science is really changing how we approach these uh, very complex problems and, and then what the School of Biological Science is really doing at the undergraduate level to bring the undergraduate researchers into these complex uh, problems. And so in the United States alone, uh, you've probably read uh, in different uh, newspapers and whatnot, uh, there's just this continuing escalation of overdose deaths, mainly by opioids. Um, we still, uh, cocaine is still a major problem, especially in, in certain underrepresented minority populations. Methamphetamine is still a huge problem. Um, but that we're really seeing the synthetic opioids, uh, fentanyl, uh, and other derivatives that are constantly being made and tried. And, uh, and so these uh, over death, uh, overdose deaths are the leading cause of unintentional fatal injury in the nation. If you look at um, vaping here, this is a very interesting uh, uh, graph. So you can see that uh, big tobacco, there's been a battle against nicotine and big tobacco for uh, several decades, and that's really been effective. You can see this massive decline, not only in teenagers, but in adults as well. Marijuana use has always been kind of stable, um, but what's happening now, as you well know from uh, media, that vaping of nicotine and vaping of THC has skyrocketed, absolutely skyrocketed and the makers of Juul and whatnot are using the same exact propaganda and same type of approaches that Big Tobacco used. We've put in restrictions on Big Tobacco, but Juuls and vaping have gone largely unrestricted uh, until now. And so this, this uh, increase in nicotine and perhaps for THC is the largest one-year increase ever seen for any substance in history. It's absolutely incredible what's happening. Now, if you turn to marijuana, the availability and legalization has completely changed the landscape across the United States. 
right, starting with Colorado. Uh, I'm from, uh, grew up in Boulder, Colorado, so we saw the legalization there happen first, um, along with uh, the Pacific Coast states. And, and so as one of my colleagues, Steve Mahler in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior likes to say, this is the largest human experiment in history. <laughs> we don't know the consequences of legalizing marijuana. It's been very difficult to study marijuana. So for example, at the National Institute of Drug Abuse, if I'm a researcher and I want to work on marijuana, I have to get a plant uh, or, or pot from one farm in Alabama. And the THC level of the pot that is provided there is extraordinarily low. And now the complexity of the plants, uh, THC and CBD levels that are provided uh, and, and are obtainable are totally different. Yet researchers can't do research on what we need to be doing. And so that, that really hinders how we can understand the beneficial effects, perhaps, the, the addictive uh, uh, effects, the harmful effects on anxiety and attention, et cetera, short-term memory, we really don't know. So how do these drugs of abuse start to affect the, the brain? And, and addiction is, is um, always carries so much baggage because initially uh, people thought that addiction is a, power, uh, a problem with willpower. It's a behavioral problem. The person's lazy. They can't say no. And, and the first time you take a drug of abuse, well, that was probably voluntary, right? You're trying to have fun, whatever. Um, and so there's all that baggage that comes with it. But what ends up happening is these drugs of abuse really start to change the neuronal function in the brain. So these are neurons in the brain. This is a, a coronal section of, of, the, of a mouse brain. And these are uh, neurons in the hippocampus, which is used for learning and memory. So this is a cartoon version of these neurons. And these neurons communicate with each other. They make contacts. And they send chemical and electrical information to each other. And that's how your neurons talk to each other and, and allow you to form um, memories and whatnot. These neurons form specific circuits in the reward circuitry of the brain, and they're also tied into the prefrontal cortex that's used to make decisions. So decision making gets, um, is intimately tied in with the reward pathways. And the reason is that the reward circuitry here, one of its main purposes is to ensure the survival of the individual and the survival of the species. So when an individual does something that's good for the individual, the, the reward circuitry rewards and reinforces that behavior, and similar for uh, propagation of the species. And so if we zoom in and look at how these neurons talk to each other, we're going to take a look at what's called the synapse. And so here, this is a synaptic uh, cleft. So one neuron is talking to another neuron. And the way it does it is it releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine. You've probably heard of dopamine before. But this is a, a chemical way that the neurons talk to each other. And this is a, a neurotransmitter that's essential for all sorts of functions in the brain. And so what does this do for us? So if, if we're hungry and we have food, the, the reward circuitry releases dopamine. You can put a sensor in there, and you can measure the amount of dopamine that's released. And you can see there's a really nice spike in dopamine. And that is reinforcing and help motivate you to do it again so that you remember when you're hungry, oh, I'm going to eat, and it's going to make me feel good. So that's food, survival of the individual. Sex, much bigger spike in dopamine. It's prolonged survival of the species. Right? So that's what your reward circuitry does. And it also helps m provide that motivation to get these rewards, because they're essential. Now, drugs of abuse they hijack that exact same machinery. So cocaine, for example, cocaine comes in and it blocks these dopamine transporters. Dopamine transporters normally bring dopamine back into the cell. So it releases it initially, and then it brings it back up. And that's normal. And that way you're ready for the next event. What cocaine does is it blocks the reuptake so the synaptic cleft is flooded with dopamine. And so your brain loves that. It feels extraordinarily good. And it's a different duration than food or other things. And so drugs of abuse, here's methamphetamine, colossal spike in dopamine that then comes back down. 
cocaine, you get a in massive increase in dopamine and it changes the duration, lasting many, many hours. And so these drugs of abuse, they affect the level of dopamine release and the duration. So they really change how your brain responds to reward. And your brain's never seen something like this before. Natural rewards don't do this. And so when your brain experiences this, it's absolutely amazing. It's like a little kid going to Disneyland for the first time. It's like, wow. So if dopamine is so good, why is more so bad? And so initially, a drug of abuse will activate the reward system like I just showed you. But then if, if somebody or an animal keeps using the drug or experiencing the drug, then the brain starts to adapt. It's not healthy and it's not good for all that neurotransmitter to be flooding the synaptic cleft. And so the brain starts to adapt, starts to withdraw synapses, starts to change neuronal function and structure. And so now these neurons, they stop responding to the drug, that's called tolerance, and they, start, they stop responding to normal natural rewards. Food is no longer rewarding, sex is no longer rewarding, so those things that used to make you feel good and used to motivate you, they no longer do. And then symptoms of withdrawal start to appear in the absence of drug, and, and there are tons and tons of different phenotypes for that, depending on the drug, depending on the person, et cetera, the level of stress that they're also undergoing. So this is a, a highly variable person to person. And eventually, the chronic disease which is de defined as compulsive drug seeking despite harmful consequences. So that is when, remember, the reward pathways in the brain are integrated with the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is making the decisions for you. And when the reward pathway starts to get hijacked and disrupted, there's no way that the prefrontal cortex can make the right decisions. So the rest of us are seeing somebody who's suffering from addiction make incredibly bad decisions and they won't pick up their children from uh, daycare, they'll drive right by and go to a bar, right? That is inexplainable to somebody who is not suffering from this brain disorder. So then what happens is this interaction between abstinence and relapse. People start to realize how bad it is, they try and get off, and then they'll relapse. And for most drugs, it's about 40 to 60% relapse, some as high as 90 to 95%. This is a quote from Jamie Lee Curtis, a uh, uh, famous actress in Hollywood. Getting sober remains my single greatest accomplishment, bigger than my husband, bigger than both my children, and bigger than any work, success, failure, anything. Letting you know that's how hard it is to overcome addiction. And so what happens? What are these relapses, uh, relapse triggers? The drug itself can cause huge relapse. Stress can cause relapse and drug paired cues. So places, sounds, visuals, uh, people, uh, music, things that were associated with the drug and taking the drug become cues that the brain associates with that reward. And that's something our brain does exceptionally well. And so these then trigger. So how is it that we have relapse? And so Drugs of abuse, they change the neuronal structure of these neurons in an almost permanent way. They change the structure and they change the function. And so relapse can occur years or decades after abstinence. And there's a saying, once an addict, always an addict. Or if you talk to somebody who's suffering from addiction, they'll tell you they're still in recovery, even if they've been abstinent for decades. They're still in recovery because they know that relapse is around the corner and is uh, unpredictable how it can happen and it's because the neurons have been permanently changed. So how does that happen? So to understand how these, these change, you have to dive into the nucleus of a, of a neuron. That's where all the, the, your genes are. In, uh, and so we know that DNA is about six feet long, and it has to fit into this microscopic nucleus, and that's a, a compaction of about 10,000 fold. If you took a piece of paper and folded it up, you could probably do it about six, seven times, depending on how strong you are. The DNA in your, one of your neurons is compacted about 10,000 times. And so getting at these genes, this is DNA that's been released from a chromosome, it's really difficult to get at those genes. And so the, the DNA is wrapped into this structure called chromatin. And so when it's really tight, the genes are turned off. When the 
the chromatins open, then the genes are turned on. And so remember these, the, especially this one, this is an open chromatin so the genes can be accessed, okay? And we need genes to be turned on so that we can change how neurons function. And so changing chromatin structure to turn gene expression on or off, like this, that's what's called epigenetics. And epi means above or beyond, and so epigenetics is beyond your genes, okay? So that's crystal clear, right? We all understand what epigenetics is. <laughs> so I'll give you some really cool examples so we can kind of set this in, in play. So here's our DNA, and then the chromatin structure are all these little modifications, these chemical tags. We'll just call them epigenetic tags. And the collection of all those tags is called the epigenome. And your epigenome integrates immense amounts of information, okay? And so these epigenetic tags change with experience, environmental interaction, and even our diet, right? This age-old war of nature versus nurture is not a real argument. The interface of nature and nurture is your epigenome. That's where that takes place. And that's why both of those arguments are correct. So if you take genetically monozygotic twins, they're absolutely genetically identical. And if you look at their epigenome, when they're born and up to a few years, they're fairly identical. By the time they're 50 years old, their epigenome will be as different as yours and mine, just from the experiences that one twin had and the other didn't. And that's why one genetically identical twin might have a mental health disorder, cancer, et cetera, and the other one will not. So that's a human example. Epigenetics can determine who becomes a queen. So if we have a worker bee and a queen bee, they are genetically identical, absolutely genetically identical. Here, the chromatin is, turn, is really, really tight. The genes can't be turned on, so the queen genes are turned off, so it's a worker bee. But if the larva is put into a queen cup, the royal jelly has chemicals that change these modifications and open up the chromatin and now allow these queen genes to be turned on. Right? So just the food source that that little larva is experiencing will turn this uh, larva into a queen bee instead of a worker. So the diet is completely changing how the, the genes are expressed. Here's an example from mouse. This is an, uh, a mouse model of obesity. These two mice are genetically identical, absolutely genetically identical. And so here's this gene called the Goody. You have two copies of it. Um, Normally, it has these epigenetic tags that keeps it turned off after a certain point in development. And, and so that gene is controlling hair color and pigmentation. But in this animal, those tags are missing, so that gene is turned on. And, whoops, and so you see a different color of hair, but the gene's been turned on in all throughout the body. And that then starts to change obesity, bone structure, all sorts of other things happen all because these modifications are missing. Now, if we took a yellow mouse that's obese and is pregnant and fed it folic acid, folic acid replaces these modifications. So almost all the pups are born normal. They have dark fur and they're normal size. If the pregnant yellow mouse is fed uh, food with BPA, found in most plastics, then those pups are going to be born abnormal and develop obesity. Right. So there's an example of diet affecting um, uh, the phenotype and morphology of the body. My lab works a lot on learning and memory, and we've spent decades showing that um, if you modify chromatin structure, you can do incredible things to learning and memory. You can transform a sub-threshold learning event into long-term memory. The undergrads love this because they think, I can study for five minutes and I can ace that exam. <laughs> So they, they, they pester me how to get a hold of that. It can generate a persistent form of memory. So normally when we encode something and we learn it for long-term memory, eventually our memory will fail for that. And if you modify this structure, you can generate a form of memory that's incredibly persistent. So rem remember these two things. I'm going to come back to them um, with what drugs of abuse do. Right. And so here, cocaine, cocaine can directly affect the chromatin structure here. And so as you can imagine, that then starts to affect gene expression. So cocaine will open chromatin structure, 
and it will induce huge changes in gene expression. Okay. And so how do we study the effect of cocaine? And so this is, uh, my, my lab works on genetically modified mice. A mouse is the, one of the only model organisms where we can manipulate a single gene in a single part of the brain and understand its function. They're a very unique uh, model organism for research, and the brain is highly similar to, to the human brain. And so here we allow the animal to explore this apparatus. There's a neutral uh, chamber in the middle, or, or it can go into either side. And so the mouse explores it. It has no preference. You can ask the mouse, where do you want to be? It wants to be all, all over the place. It enjoys all of it. If then you pair one context, this is the paired side, if you allow the animal then to have cocaine in this side, and then you later put it back in the middle and say, where do you want to be? You give it a preference test. The animal will spend all of its time over here. It loves that room, right? Just like a human. The human studies have been done exactly the same. Uh, researchers have built up apartments with certain uh, furniture and, and done this in humans. You see the exact same thing. So that's a context cocaine-associated memory. And so that cocaine opens up chromatin structure, changes gene expression, the neurons change their function, and they associate that context with the reward. Right? That's what your brain does. It remembers and motivates you to find those rewards, and in order to do so, it has to remember where those rewards are. Right? I can drive to McDonald's with my eyes closed. <laughs> so can that be extinguished? Right? And now we want to see, OK, now if we understand it, how can we fix it? How can we improve things? So now we want to extinguish this drug memory. So we, we show the animal over and over and over that there's no drug there. And eventually, the brain will start to pick up on dissociating that, uh, the context from cocaine. And so the preference will come down over weeks. Okay, so yes, we can extinguish that. But if the animal then re-experiences a drug that it was, uh, had originally seen, then you see this huge preference come back. Okay? So re-exposure to cocaine causes this relapse, identical to what happens in humans. Okay, so now the million dollar question is, if cocaine hijacks the reward system, can we manipulate the epigenome, enhance memory, and enhance that extinction memory? So can we force the brain to extinguish the association between the context and the cocaine? All right, so can manipulating the epigenome enhance extinction of that cocaine associated memory and prevent relapse? So we take the, uh, we, we need to open chromatin. And so for that, we work with industry partners in Boston, several different companies that develop specific little molecules that change chromatin structure. And then we give that to the animal. So first, the animal, the different groups, they give them a pretest. They don't have a preference. Then you pair one side with cocaine. They all develop a massive preference. And then this is an extinction test. This first time they have a preference test, there's no drug. We're just asking, where do you want to be? But that's a sub-threshold learning event. The brain is actually capable of noticing, oh, there's no cocaine. But it doesn't really want to change its behavior. But if we open up chromatin and we allow that sub-threshold information to be encoded into long-term memory, now you can see that in this, this medium dose group, those animals extinguish that memory in one day, right? We just helped the brain do what it could do, but it wasn't. So this HDAC3 inhibitor can enhance extinction of cocaine-associated memory. Okay, that's great, that's relevant, therapeutically relevant, but epigenetics can do so much more. It can make persistent memories. That's one of the things it does. And so does the new memory, extinction memory persist? So now we're gonna challenge the, that, uh, the animal. So we give them a cocaine-induced uh, triggered relapse. So the control animals, they all show this huge relapse. The low dose doesn't do a whole lot. But the animals that had this medium dose, they don't relapse at all. And so this HDAC3 inhibitor generated a persistent form of extinction. The brain learned really, really well that that context is not associated with cocaine. That's an extinction memory and it 
it prevents relapse, right? And so in, in rehab centers, they do something called habituation um, and uh, CTB, uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Um, these are roughly ways of doing this kind of extinction work. But if we're able to develop these compounds for human use, which is what the companies are, that we're working with are doing, then we might finally be able to do something that is very persistent. Okay, so epigenetics is master regulator of gene expression in the neurons. Um, it controls memory, controls reward, and absolutely tied in with addiction. And so that's just a little vignette of, of research going on. Um, but really, something as complex as addiction takes a team science approach. And, and understanding how to do team science is something that is going on here at UCI and in the School of Biological Sciences. And, and why team science? It allows you to tackle major health problems. They're, these are global health problems, not just in the United States. And they arise from multiple sources. They're extraordinarily complex. It involves cross-disciplinary teams. That gives you diverse perspectives, right? And that's the hardest thing to do, is integrate diverse perspectives from different levels of analysis, different backgrounds, et cetera. All sorts of different researchers, human to animal to molecular. And then the return value on solving these complex problems goes way beyond the initial goal. So for example, when the Apollo mission went to the moon, they brought back 850 pounds of rock and soil. OK. What they did to get there, they created these microcircuits. So if you put a computer to get that rudimentary space shuttle to the moon, it would have been the size of this entire you know, area, huge. And they had to turn that into these tiny little microcircuits. The two guys that developed that founded Intel. Right? So those are the kinds of return value that you get in trying to solve these complex problems. What does it take? A synergy of expertise across team members. In, 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 in a lot of research teams, it's always been a little more modular. Um, now everything's coming together, and that it takes some learning how to do that. You need huge institutional infrastructure and facilities, like something that you see at UCI, an R1 research institution. Just a little bit of funding. <laughs> communication. This communication has completely changed across labs, within labs. And, and probably the absolute most important thing is a culture that supports mutual respect, transparency, honesty, values, and diversity, and fearlessness. Right? And this is something that I'm, I'm very proud to say that the School of Biological Science has been spending a lot of time and effort, even hiring external help to make us have the culture that we all want. It's absolutely exceptional. And the undergraduates at UCI get to experience that. That's a huge shift. So also in the School of Biological Sciences, to attack something like addiction, it's not just a couple little handful of labs. We brought the community together in 2015. The School of Biological Sciences uh, formed the UC Irvine Center for Addiction Neuroscience. That really started to bring everyone together to work together. The, uh, we received uh, some funding from the Office of Research as well, once they realized uh, the power of this group. In 2018, we received a, a NIDA Center of Excellence. Th these are flagship funding opportunities at the National Institute of Drug Abuse. This is to understand, like I was talking about, marijuana, the biggest human experiment ever. We know nothing about it. This, is, this uh, NIDA Center here is to understand the effects of adolescent exposure to THC on the adult brain. And there are incredible effects on the brain. There are also incredible effects on different organs in the body that had not been discovered yet. In 2020, in the future, we're working on getting a training grant for our, the graduate students um, and postdoctoral fellows uh, to train in the neurobiology of addiction. And really, we're trying to aspire to become a premier site of substance use disorder research and, and training. And so in BioSci, we've been developing novel approaches to study addiction. It takes all sorts of different approaches to study different drugs. Novel methods to analyze big data. The, the more modern your approaches become, the bigger the data sets become. 
and then you have to figure out ways to use uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all sorts of different ways to approach this data. We can't handle this data just eyeballometrically. We need better ways to do that. And so we have faculty coming in to, to do that. We're teaming up with industry partners and changing how academic research interfaces with industry partners to really translate what we do at the basic research level into human uh, efficacy. And then we have tons of different kinds of ways to uh, modernize imaging from human to rodent. This is one example uh, from a uh, mouse. So now you can clear the brain and you can look at a single gene being expressed through every cell in the brain during a learning event. So this is the hippocampus and the amygdala here. And so you can zoom in, you can follow the different neurons. This is the prefrontal cortex for decision making, how those neurons um, send their tracks down to other regions. And so this starts to completely change neuroscience. It's thrown neuroscience on its head. So now the idea is, well, that's great for the researchers, but we want to get our undergraduates involved in that, right? And so there's a huge commitment to undergraduate education. So that video you just saw, undergraduates can now take a class to do exactly that. They're learning how to clear brains and look at gene expression throughout the brain using big data analyses. They're interacting with industry partners as an undergraduate researcher and then interacting with labs such as mine where I have a problem that I'm studying in addiction I need to access to some of these things. So the undergraduate researchers then become that expertise and that interface. There, I send them brains, they clear, they look at the gene expression, and they're doing meaningful research. They're not just doing a, a little lab bench type thing. This is a horrible story, but when I was an undergrad, I was doing organic chemistry, couldn't stand it, and I did most of my experiments just with water and I copied my lab partner's notes, right? <laughs> just going through the motion. It was meaningless. But here, we're doing meaningful research, meaningful lab experiences. So the, there's a huge culture of undergraduate research. Uh, the labs really become a second family and home on campus for the undergrads. When they're in between classes, they're hanging out in the labs, and, and that's kind of a safe place for them where they really feel the sense of belonging, not just this huge university. Um, it's a real place of belonging. And then fostering you know, through the school, this fearless and global thinking community. And that's something that's totally changed as well. Not being afraid to tackle these global issues just because they're so complex and difficult. So, so with that, these are the undergrads that had been in my lab alone. You know, a lot of the labs look like this. This is just in the past 14 years and the current undergraduates in the lab right now. Uh, thanks to all of them and thank you all for listening and I have about 10 minutes for questions. If they're already, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I have a thanks. couple of questions. Mm -hmm. the, the transparent brain you just showed, is, mm -hmm. is that in a, in a living animal or, or not? No, so uh, right now that's Wait. being done ex vivo. Yeah. yeah. Wait, we're not quite there right, yet. Right, right. So we have yeah. other teams that are developing in vivo imaging. So they're using uh, fluorescent activators. So when a neuron fires, there's a fluorescent signal and you either have an in vivo scope or in vivo uh, fibers that can pick up on that spiking pattern. Um, yeah. And there you can study yeah. in vivo, yeah. And uh, the other question is with the, you said the mechanisms of addiction are, are similar for mm -hmm. say cocaine, which, which is what you study, which is yeah. what you showed, um, and for I guess other substances. Um, so for the HDAC inhibitors, the, the, mm -hmm. those great results, are you seeing the same results for opioids for yeah. other yeah. types of addictions, like say social media addiction. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like we haven't tried that one. Oh. Uh, <laughs> e e eating disorders, yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah, I haven't been able to extinguish my uh, son's interest in his phone. Um, but uh, other labs have taken those findings and applied it to morphine um, and alcohol. Those are the two big study replication studies that we've seen so far. Um, and then the, the companies that we work with they're developing the inhibitors so that um, there's a nice brain to plasma ratio so that when it's taken orally, it does enter the brain. Uh, the hard thing in humans is in a mouse, we know if it's working, right? In a human, it's harder to know. And so we're developing um, uh, pet imaging techniques 
uh, both in humans and in rodents, where we can look at the synaptic density change. And so those are really cool approaches where you, know, you don't have to sacrifice the person or the mouse um, and see that the drugs are having an effect changing neuronal function and structure like you want. So yeah. how close are those inhibitors to clinical trials? Yeah, so uh, right now there's uh, one that is currently being tested for toxicology and safety issues. There's another one that's further advanced. It's probably, I think, entering phase two, uh, but not for addiction. There, the easiest um, application is for uh, age-related memory impairment and dementia. Uh, so that's what the company, there's more money to be had there, so the company has focused on that. Yep. You can ask anything you want. Yeah. Oh. You started to mention things about marijuana and what can you provide right now for what, what are you finding so far? For, sorry, for what? For marijuana. Oh, so, so the, the work that we've been doing um, as, a, as a group here, this, this NIDA Center of Excellence, is um, exposing adolescent animals uh, to THC. And, and that's been very difficult. It took us about a year just to establish the parameters to do that. Um, once that was established, then we start uh, looking at the effects on learning and memory, cognition. Um, uh, THC seems to... Uh, collect in, in fatty adipose tissue, so it starts to change metabolism in the adult animal as well. So the metabolism has changed persistently, uh, cognition has changed, um, and it's only a two-week exposure of THC during when the brain is developing that has that effect in the adult, and there's not been any exposure since. And so those are the things that we really need to understand at the level of the human. So at the level of the human, NIDA has funded uh, one of the largest studies in history called the ABCD study. And that is tracking about uh, maybe 10 or more thousand children from the age of about six on. And so they're starting to, they collect and look at those children, they collect samples, um, blood, et cetera. Um, and they'll do so throughout their lives to characterize these things and, and determine the effects of adolescent nicotine exposure, adolescent marijuana exposure uh, on the adult brain. But it's really extraordinary that that kind of research has just not been funded uh, until now. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit, this is somewhat far afield from the actual topic, mm -hmm. but I, it does have to do with dopamine uh, in the brain. I, for many years, had an interest in somewhat what are considered somewhat extreme sports and did some research about this. And uh, one so called expert had a theory that people who are attracted to extreme sports and who engage in it mm. uh, over and over and over again have a naturally very low levels of dopamine in their. Uh, in their bodies and engage in extreme sports like extreme skiing or mountain biking in order to get a spike of dopamine production. Could yeah. you, do you have any comment at all? Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably true. And, and, and things that in, in our brains, you know, we're, we're good at resetting. So foods, so for example, with food, if you eat the same exact thing at dinner, you'll eventually get tired of it. It's not rewarding. Um, you know, try that with children, right? Um, but if you give a certain amount of period, a uh, time in between, it's rewarding again. You enjoy it again. But it has to be spaced in, in a certain way. And so there's probably two things going on with, with extreme athletes. Uh, one is this spike in dopamine and how dopamine is rewarding to them. Uh, second, their fear response is nowhere close to ours, right? So. If you take someone um, like Alex um, Hall and I, the, the free solo climber, right? If you watch that documentary, he gets it scanned. He gets an MRI scan. And we have researchers here that do that. Uh, Jim McGaugh, who founded our department, he's the one who broke open the uh, whole understanding of how emotions and core and glucocorticoids, so these stress hormones, how they help you form memories normally. 
um, the amygdala releases uh, 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 hormones and, and has and just lights up when you see something fearful. And, and, and that's normal in all of us. Um, his doesn't light up at all. He, you know, images that would set our amygdala just boom, light up like a Christmas tree, nothing. And so he can go scale without ropes, right? It's very methodical for him. It's, it's a habit learning. It's a different part of the striatum in, in the brain that's used for some of that at that level of expertise. And like he says, he's not doing it to be crazy or to kill himself. It's just that's his comfort level. One, because he is such an extraordinary expert in that because of his striatal function in the brain. But second, he's not afraid because his amygdala isn't firing like ours would. So, so it's probably a mixture of both of those things. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy Parents Day.